Okay. Uh, I think we can start. It's the top of the hour, one o'clock. And so, welcome everybody to the LISP working group session for the people in the room and everybody that is online. I hope every day everybody's fine. <laughs> um, the usual not well. You're supposed to read this uh, during the registration process, uh, the IETF. Um, some tips about uh, this hybrid setup. So in person, you can log in in the lightweight tool, Medico tool is the small uh, uh, mobile phone icon that you have on the agenda. Um, by that, you automatically sign the blue sheets. And if you wish, you can actually, if you are a presenter, decide to share the content, so your slides, and you can control the, the slides. Plan B is I share and you just say next. Okay, uh, uh, as for the good old times. Uh, remote participants is the mythical setup we had in the, the last two years, basically. So you 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 see the, the video stream, the audio stream, the Jabber uh, chat, okay, uh, as usual. For the questions remote and here in the room, you queue up, so you raise your hand from the Mythico uh, tool, and you, for the person here in the room, you go to the mic only when it's up to you to ask the question. We don't need to physically queue up, okay? And when you start speaking, please give your name. Ah, yeah, thanks for <laughs> uh, Just a, a, a small reminder of the code of conduct, which is important here in the IETF is about uh, respecting everybody here in the room and online uh, to have in personal discussion, always based on technical uh, points and know that everybody's already contributed here. Okay, so uh, I forgot, I'm Luigi. Uh, Joel is online, we are the co-chairs of the groups. Uh, Padma, our secretary, is also uh, currently online remotely on the Mythico system. Here you have the usual pointers for everything, the chart, the Jabber room, stream, Mythico, agenda and slides. So here also the material, the slides that you are seeing right now. Um, a quick update on the status that uh, of our working group. So we have uh, a few documents, five actually, that are already in the RFC editor queue, which is a good point. Okay, they are just a little bit stuck there because they, they have uh, references to documents that are still in the pipeline. Actually, we have uh, five that are in the in Alvaro's queue <laughs> because uh, they passed the working group uh, uh, last call. I mean, so they. Alvaro needs some time to process not only our documents, but all the, 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 the working groups that he's uh, overseeing, right? And uh, there is the, it's difficult to read, but the last document at the bottom is the Young model, which has have been discussed, I think, last year. And uh, I'm sure we are pretty close to the working group last call. So at some point this year, we may go for it, I would say, okay? Um, today, uh, the, the other working group documents are the uh, uh, LISP L2, L3 ID mobility. We will have a presentation today. The YAM model, uh, um, I just said, uh, well, it will not be discussed today. There is a mistake in the, in the slides. And then there are a few documents actually that are there uh, and uh, we should try this year to discuss whether or not we want to move them forward uh, and so go for, uh, conclude the work and go for a working group last call or check whether the working group has want to drop the, this work. Um, we have a few tasks to be accomplished. I would say there is the, the not traversal document uh, that should be done. Uh, there was a, an explicit request in the charter. We have it in the charter. So it would be good if we also focus on, uh, on this one this year. Um, the LISP DDT RFC, uh, so 81111, um, 
we have a early allocation in that document, but the document is um, experimental, which means to, to make the allocation permanent, we need to uh, um, move the document to the Lisp DDT uh, on the standard track. So we have to think about have a, a one a eight one 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 bis in order to standardize also the the DDT system. Okay. So there is uh, uh, the fact that uh, in the Ayana we have a Lisp uh, packet type defined in this RFC as it is experimental, so it could not be permanent because it's experimental. Now, to make it permanent, and the point is we are renewing this for the second time, which means uh, the first time we just asked. Second, first renewal was with, with the AD Alvaro that said that that's fine. Now we have AD and IESG that has to say it's okay. So we don't have so much time. Uh, <laughs> so, because I don't know how much we can uh, ask, continue asking to renew the allocation. Okay. So we, we uh, I think these are two, two main things we should try to accomplish this year. So the NAT and DDT this, let's say, okay. And as for the agenda today, uh, the administrative is over. Uh, we have AID mobility, Alberto will be present. Okay. <laughs> okay, Alberto Bis will present, so Fabi. <laughs> so you, you will present the reliable transport, okay. Then we have Bernard Heindel, if I pronounce correctly, uh, which will present the crown-based LISP, okay. And then Sharon will give an update on the LISP mobility routing. So unless there is anybody wants to do any ad uh, agenda bashing, uh, Fabio, you can come up. You want me to share? Okay. All right, so this is a quick update um, about the EID mobility uh, draft. Um, yeah, so this is the usual suspect authors. Uh, there were a few comments that came up uh, in the last um, ITF online, and um, we didn't have a chance to update the document uh, uh, yet, but um, you know, the, um, there was some work on layer two multi-homing um, that uh, needs to be done to, to complete the, uh, the last section uh, in the document itself. Um, I just have an update uh, on the um, discussion that went in the mailing list, so we can go to the, to the next slide. And basically, uh, what uh, this was raised at the, at the last meeting, as I, as I said, right? So uh, the, the question is how do we identify the uh, layer two uh, multi-homing groups? And uh, the, the discussion and the problem is, you know, uh, if there is a, um, a site that is multi-home, uh, how can you identify univocally uh, the, um, uh, the group um, when there are multiple airlocks that are uh, present in that site? So, um, there was some discussion, should we uh, use uh, the site ID or should we go up for uh, uh, a new identifier uh, at all? So next slide. And it seems that uh, the conversation is going toward uh, using a new identifier, the Ethernet segment ID. Uh, it's a 32-bit value uh, that will identify uh, uh, uniquely the group of uh, XDRs. Um, the uh, XTRs that are multi-home, they, they get to register their um, ESID uh, with the, the corresponding airlock. And in this way, the mapping system can aggregate the uh, multiple airlocks uh, so that they all part of the same uh, group. In this way, the two issues that you want to solve are uh, individuate uh, univocally who is the designated forwarder, select it, 
and uh, um, basically uh, have a way um, that you can reconcile when there is a split horizon uh, solution. Um, in addition, uh, in this way, uh, Ethernet segment ID uh, can also be associated to uh, EIDs, uh, not only uh, to an lock. And in this way, you can deal with the uh, uh, aliasing that uh, allow for uh, load balancing um, when multi homing is, uh, is active. And yeah, so this I think is the part that uh, uh, where progress was made. Um, we will uh, update the, the text to reflect this uh, consideration here. And I think that the last slide, or there is another one. Uh, okay, the last slide. And there is Dino in the queue for oh. a question. Hey, Dino. We miss you. Hear me? This is Dino. Hey. Hi. Long time. You can hear me okay? Yeah. So um, I, um, I remember recalling uh, that there was no reason not to use the site ID. Do you know why that has changed? And um, because because now we have an issue because what if the site ID is different than the ESID? Is are the are the XTRs known to be in the same site or not? Um, so, and the reason why at last ITF we talked about or the IETF in the summer we talked about um, using the site ID so we wouldn't have to change the packet formats. So do you know what um, what uh, came up to want to make that change? Uh, um, can I take that? Yeah, yeah. So th this other your, no, your name. Yeah. Uh, so, Dino, this is actually it's reflecting the, the discussion on the mailing list where you said, and I think it's a good point, that an XTR may have different VLANs. So, you may have different uh, segments on the, on the XTR, and then you may or may not want to put them uh, in the same site ID or like the same uh, using a single site ID to cover all those different layer two segments. So we were kind of um, assimilating your point and <laughs> trying to, 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 to be coherent with the discussion on the list. Ah, so that's what's confusing because the, um, the slides say that it's an ESID for two XTRs where it's actually an ESID per VLAN per pair of XTRs or more than one. Is that I true? Yeah, I guess there, yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, the flash were not specific. So I guess one way to put it is the ESID would be for layer two segment, which I guess you can say like per VLAN if you wish. Does that make sense now? Yeah, maybe you should call it a VLAN a segment ID or something like that. But, and it needs to be clear. Um, and this, these are put in registers. That's going to be a long list of. It could be a long list, right? Uh, yeah, but I mean, if they are different segments, they are different segments, right? I yeah. Think, I'm not so now I mean, the NAP register has to have up to four thousand entries in it. So there's a lot of protocol machinery that has to be done. So regarding the the, the name, I may need to check. I believe that Ethernet segment ID is what uh, other protocols use as well. But I'm fine if we want okay. to call it here VLAN ID either way. I think, it, at least for me, I don't know if someone else has not. Okay, it, does, it doesn't matter really what the name is. Yeah. That's just a, a moot point. But I'm worried about the scalability of this now. Can't can't we say that um, um, one or uh, one or more XTRs are selected as a designated forwarder for all VLANs? Like uh, a, a default because forward. because this is a big change in the map register, and I don't know if it's worth it for l2 um for l2 um, overlays that's the thing i'm worried about there's there's a big cost here in um designing this in for the benefit so i'm making a judgment call that's all yeah um i don't have an answer for you dino and actually you are the multi tester, so i would want an ask you um so the the esid is intended to address at least three problems like this is the forward and multicast the split horizon and then the, the aliasing on, on the on the EADs. Um, so if you have a specific uh, you know optimization for the vicinity forwarder case, we can certainly uh, include that. Yeah, what I'm what I'm suggesting is use site ID and you use designated forwarder 
election or selection for all VLANs. That's all. And you just, you, you make that statement and we don't have to change the packet formats. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that, that we are back in the problem that we have originally, right? That you may have multiple VLANs in the same XTR. Yeah, but I didn't suggest it's an all or one um, issue. That's how we could solve the problem. Because now you have now you have to list each VLANs that are active. Well, you have to you have to potentially have up to four thousand entries in the map register, which makes the packet really large, right? And even if VLANs are not in use, if one gets configured at some point, you have to know what the, who the designated forwarder is. At um, at the at, you have to do it before you configure the VLANs at the site, I think, or you're going to have a broadcast loop, right? Regarding the number of, of VLANs, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. I mean, I, so can you have really like, let's say a registration where you would have all the VLANs configured at once because you usually you send a, a, a registration which is EAD to airlock, right? And, and then we need to add an identifier to, to map the airlocks, but also to map the, the ID for the aliasing case. So, I don't it doesn't know matter. Have that. Albert, it doesn't matter if it's um, all. It could be 50, and that's still a lot, right? Because now you have to list it, everything. But typically, unless you, unless you use a 16 bit bit string, and I you. I understand what you're saying. You know, I'm thinking from the, you know, kind of operation of the protocol that typically you send a single EAD on the map register. Theoretically, you can send more, but typically you send just one EAD, right? Per map register message. So, um, yeah, but if, yeah, you might, I mean, no, you may want to pack them, right? You may, but typically we don't do that. I don't remember now the text on the BIS documents. It may even say that it's not, uh, yeah, I don't want to, to quote the test with, without having the RFC on top of me, in front of me, but, um, yeah, My that's why I'm saying it's not worth it because there's a lot more discussion that has to go in, like how you're going to do it. So let's so. let's let's do, let's do this, Dino. You know, let's maybe for the NSATF, we between now and the NSATF, we can look at the scalability of the you know number of VLANs, and we can discuss in the next ATF how to how to handle that. Sounds good. Uh, you sure. can even start the discussion. No, in no, the mailing, list. The mailing list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. You have the let's input of everybody, to... so that we reach yeah, next the ATF. Next. ATF with a decision yeah. or do, a solution. Do you want to send Dino one uh, note to the mailing list and we use that to start yeah. the... Basically what you're saying is that uh, we should consider scalability because uh, uh, there are uh, up to 4,000 uh, yeah. entries uh, per each EAD and EAD can be uh, grouped in the registration. So, and, uh, yeah, and the other problem is, even if there is that if there's, one, there's one segment ID Per map register, where if it's if you're going to put multiple um, MAC address EIDs in the map register, then you have to have an ES, ES ID per EID, which means it has to go in the EID record. Which means now you have to specify wherever an EID record is used in all the messages, you have to specify what the segment ID is. And for layer three, you don't even need it. So you're going to end up using up the space. Uh, inefficiently for layer three. Yeah, That's why I think it should be all or nothing. You you select a designated the... forwarder for the site for all VLANs. Yeah. That's what I, I think we should do. There are people that need to chime in that are uh, US based and probably they cannot uh, comment now. Um, let's do okay. the discussion on the list, Dino, so, so they can chime okay. in as well. But point taken. Okay. No, by the way, the, so if we end up with a map register that is too big, there is something that solves it that is called reliable transport. We're going to talk about that in a second. So, <laughs> so we gather that you support reliable transport. <laughs> we are stretching it a bit. <laughs> okay. That's okay. I think we have an action, uh, Dino. If you can post uh, uh, a note to the mailing list uh, yeah. regarding scalability considerations, and we can take it from there. Sounds okay. good, Dino? Yep, sounds good. I'll do it. Thank you. Thanks, Dino. So the queue seems empty, so 
All right, Alberto, you can come up. So now very timely, right? Reliable transfer solving some issues like two large map registers. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go next. Okay, uh, yeah, this is again trying to uh, summarize or, or address some changes that have happened on the draft. Uh, well, I mean, no, not on the draft, but um, in, the, in the mailing list uh, that we have discussed since last idea, mainly these two points. That is, um, if, a, if an ETR supports reliable transfer, how does it know that, you know, the map server supports it too, so it can switch to reliable transfer? And, and then the question about what about other transfer protocols that are not just TCP and we've been the, the main the main example. So next. So the, the problem of um, an ETR that wants to use reliable transfer but doesn't know if the if the map server supports it, right? So by default, the, the ETR is going to always start with UDP map registers. That is what the protocol specifies. And at some point, it needs to to do something, right? So it can switch to to reliable transport if the map server supports it too. So, so how can we deal with this? Next. And uh, I think this is what was discussed um, uh, as, as part of the you know the, the follow up from, from last meeting. That is, okay, we have some bits available on the map register message, so we could potentially use one to signal that the ETR wants to establish a reliable transport uh, with the map server, a reliable transport session with the map server. So uh, this is the classical discussion that we have had in, in you know, multiple uh, times in the, in the working group. That is, we set up a new bit to one, uh, if the, and, and we're gonna see the bits in, in the next couple of slides. We set the new bit to one, if the map server supports reliable transport, it's going to reply with with the the equivalent bit in the modify set to one as well. If it doesn't support reliable transport or the map server is an old one that uh, or, or sorry, if 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 it supports reliable transport but it doesn't want to enable, or if the map server is an old one that doesn't support reliable transport, then the map notify is going to come back with the with the bit to zero. So that way the ETR knows if it can or cannot establish a, a reliable transport session with the with the map server. So next. Uh, so this is showing the possible location of the reliable transport bit on the map register, which seems which seems straightforward. I think the uh, the next slide. I think the map notify one may be more interesting because uh, one question for the working group is um, where do we put the bit on the map notify? So this slide is showing the bit in the same position as in the map register, so it's kind of mirroring the map register uh, message. But we don't need to put it there. I honestly don't have a strong opinion there. I don't know if anyone wants to to comment on that. But this is something we need to to decide where the 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 bit goes. Next. Uh, did you take question now. Oh yeah, Dino sure, yeah. Is, uh, Oh, Dino, the queue already. Okay, good. Dino. I think it should be uh, the that lowercase r bit in the map notify should be um, next to the record count field because. If you need to use um, more bits in the map notify, you want to keep the contiguous bits there. Say you need 10 bits, then you would have to split up that new field on either side of the R. So I'd make it right justified. That's 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 fine with me. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other opinion. So yeah, unless someone yeah, wants to do otherwise, we can put it close to the record count. Okay, I guess you can continue. Yeah. Um, okay, the the other point to discuss is quick support. Um, I guess that there are two questions regarding quick, and I'm not a quick expert, so so I may miss some some aspects here. But one point is which port are we gonna use for quick uh, reliable transfer? Right for. TCP reliable transport is, is uh, evident. We use uh, 4342 in TCP, and that's fine. For quick, uh, shall we reserve a different port? Shall we just use 4342 UDP with quick on top? Shall we use any port that quick specify as default? 
um, to be honest, I don't have an answer for for this one. Um, maybe let's yeah, let's just chat with Dino before we move to the second. Okay, part. Dino. Um, yeah, you can't use forty three forty two because then the list daemon um, in the implementation will receive quick encoded messages. And so it has to just use quick as it's defined today. So what it is would your... Be a, it would be uh -huh. if you use 4342, right? How do you see this, Dino? Because I, I, for me right now, it's an open question. Like, which port do we use? Use the, use the UDP port number that's assigned to quick in the standard. I, I did a quick search on the, I didn't find it, but I may be, you know, missing it because I'm not quick expert. So is there, do you know if there is a quick port on the quick standard? Absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Or it can't run over UDP, right? So, um, yeah, send, send it on the list maybe, or, or send it to, to the authors of the draft and, and we can use that number. Um, and I, I'm you don't have to specify it. Just like you're not specifying how to use, well, you're specifying how to use TCP because, um, uh, um, let's see. I mean, if you, need, you want, you, need a port. you don't send, an application doesn't send over UDP and then sends over quick. It interfaces with quick directly, right? But on which port? That's the question. Um, So for me, the question is, is which port number? Oh, I see. Because the the reliable transport now for over TCP uses forty three forty two. TCP, that's correct. Oh, I think this is another UDP port number then, right? Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's what I'm trying to to then get. It, that, that does that doesn't make sense. We're, I think we're missing something. Um, if I may chime in, uh, I, I think that there is a different uh, difference between the quick socket that you open and you decide a certain port number and what is going on the wire. On the wire, you will see quick with the port number, quick port port number somehow. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert. Yeah, there, there's just a risk, but we need to clarify. Okay, so, so, so this is okay. So what number one should say? Um, should we reserve quick port 4342? But there is no such because thing. Because on, on the wire, you don't see two UDP headers in this message, correct? So, but, if I mean, I mean, if you want to connect with quick so on a specific port number, then maybe this is doable. How is it is done? I don't know. But yeah. we should just look at the same technique, yeah. I, I would say. but. We need to check and, and discuss on the mailing right. list. On, but I on think we should make it consistent with TCP, right? Use the same the, the, control port number for that transport layer, so to speak. So, you know, the, the substrate of, of Quick is, is UDP. As far as I know, they, yeah. they do, you know, upper things, but the, the baseline is, is, is UDP. So yeah, yeah, but, but the application doesn't care about it. Just like the application doesn't care that Lisp can run over... The, Lisp, the application that runs over TCP, doesn't care that TCP runs over IP, just like it shouldn't care that Quick runs over UDP because it's a lower layer and it's not, it's modular and it doesn't need to know that information and shouldn't touch it because the one who's originating the UDP packet is the Quick protocol, not Lisp. Lisp just runs over a Quick socket, so to speak, right? But the draft, the documents, the list documents today, they are very clear on which ports we should use for TCP or UDP, right? So at least a list uh, daemon or list okay. element so, is going to listen on, on those ports and, and be able to parse and understand the list messages, right? Yes, agree. So what I'm trying to say is we say that Lisp runs over UDP port 4342, over TCP port 4342, and over quick port 4342. That's all. So what confused me and what triggered the question that number one has UDP here? Okay. So, so I think that, that 
we are you know going to a more fundamental question and, and i guess this may be a quick discussion of, but so uh, tcp and gdp you identify those by the protocol identifier right quick as, as far as i know and i may be completely wrong it has no protocol identifier yeah. you have a, a, a udp header so that the protocol we identifier is UDP. the seven port number I don't think there's. I don't think when you run over the quick, there's. Yes. 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 So we we. Uh, I mean, we need to to check how how is done. Yeah. So apparently, nobody okay. here is a, a quick expert. Let's, <laughs> let's take the discussion. I, I would the, say that we we check and we discuss this on the mailing list. Fair enough. This uh, fair enough. Sp okay. specific point. Let's do that. Sounds then, good. On the um, the other side of the question is. If the ETF supports more than one reliable transport, typically TCP and Quick, how does it know which one to use? Um, the authors of the draft are leaning towards leaving this an implementation choice, so that if you support two, you could potentially pro for 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 those two and and pick whichever the member server replies or whichever you you like if it replies the two. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any specific opinion on on this i i have a comment on this i, I do agree this could be a an implementation choice the fact that you, you don't necessarily need to implement tcp you don't need to to use quick uh, as long as you have the basic which is udp now how do i signal that I can do more than UDP. This goes to the previous slide. If there is the reliable transport bit, it does not tell me whether I should use TCP or, or Quick. It, it, it does not. So probably so, to pro. Well, or or you or you how? use one bit for a different transport. You have a T bit for the TCP. You have a Q bit for the quantum bit, no, the quick bit. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's a suggestion. I mean, this may be, uh, I, I can send an email on the mailing list so that we discuss this point. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine, yeah. Um, I guess that we're not going to see a reset different back. transport protocols. Oh. Right? Well, we don't have zillions of yeah. transport protocol, I, I mean. So I. I'm, I, I don't think we, we're going to waste so many bits on, like on in this. The, in the VLAN case. So, because... so, okay. Uh, I think that's a good discussion for the mailing list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. something to be bonded at okay. somehow. Okay. Um, okay, that's it. My end. Oh, no, no, there is a very final question. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Working group adoption. Are we fine? Is there anyone that wants to say something before we call for a working group adoption of the document. It has been sitting as an individual draft for too long, I think, and, and it's becoming more and more relevant. Uh, I have one one uh, final comments just on the content in general on, on, on the document. is uh, about the security part. I don't remember how, how it's um, dealt with. It just came up to my mind. I mean, if we use TCP, may, we may want to use TLS in order to secure the communication. I mean, if if we push this document forward, it's like LISPSEC. I mean, we th there will be a thorough security review. So we, we have to make sure that it goes through. Doesn't mean that we need this to be done before adoption, to be clear. Mm -hmm. oh, OK, but uh, I, I would put it uh, as a action item that we check whatever should be done i don't i don't, I don't remember to be honest that's, but, that's, uh, no, that's, that's, that's a good point yeah 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 so uh, otherwise we we got stuck somewhere else uh, along the path we just <laughs> we know how it works so no no uh, and, and, um you're, yeah you're right that the security reviews may point to that so yeah okay okay good as for the adoption uh i, I don't think there is any issue we can uh, we can call for adoption here now and then check on the mailing list as usual. Okay. So we'll try to use the, the amazing tool that um, uh, that we have here for, to check for adoption. This, so if you agree that this document is worthwhile and should be adopted, we work and we solve all the issues that have been discussed right now, you go on the Mythico and you are, raise your hand. For, for people in the room and uh, remotely.
I will close it now. And uh, we, we have a clear consensus. I mean, uh, I'm not sure it's worth it to, to read it, but 90% uh, uh, or more of the people raised the, that participated in the poll raised their hand. So uh, I guess at this stage, uh, we go for no, the option to check on the mailing list. And the next, now we concluded this part. Okay. Quick question on the poll. Yeah. Um, Dino, that's yes. assuming, it's, yeah, this is Dino. Um, it assumes that the, if we go, the reliable transport uh, document goes uh, working group document, that the BIS documents don't reference it, or otherwise we have another dependency, correct? Uh, anyway, the, the BIS documents are already there uh, and out. We, we, we fix any issue that is raised during the ITFE uh, review or the different area review or the ISG review, but uh, there is no reference there. Uh, there is no as reference as far as I remember. Yeah, yeah. And, you're not, and you're not proposing to put a reference there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Right, no. okay, good. I just want to clarify. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Albert. So, Bernard. It's weird. Uh, uh, I, I feel uncomfortable to read all the, the details. It's not consensus, rough consensus. Anyway, sorry, Bernard, go ahead. So, thank you. Uh, my name is Bernard Heidel. First time at the ITF, and I'll give you a short update on the draft title uh, LISP uh, ground based uh, RFC. Uh, about the mobility and multi-link solution for safety critical communication and aviation. It's a specific use case for LISP in, in this domain. So next slide, please. And to sort of structure, I want to give you an overview about the, 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 the LISP scope in, in this specific solution and the concept and uh, how we we using LISP to to, to provide multi-link uh, usage and the local policy overwriting if you have multiple uh, routing uh, links to the aircraft, and I want to conclude with with some standardization requests for this ITF group. So next slide, please. So the ground-based list soap. Uh, we are mainly working here for safety critical communication in aviation, and the ground-based list solution is implementing one mobility and multi-link. Uh, solution for this um, safety critical communication aviation and we're mainly standardizing this on ICAO. Um, this system enables um, the aircraft and the ground applications and hosts uh, to use multiple air ground access networks during all phases of flight. It distributes all the relevant information um, to the mobility and multi-link decision elements, which I will just explain then in the next slide, on ground and in the airborne IPS system. So one specific protocol we using um, for exchanging information between the aircraft and the ground, it's called the Air Ground Mobility Interface Protocol. That's a domain specific protocol and we will only specify this in ICAO and it's not uh, focus here in ITF and we're not planning to, to standardize this here. And we are using LISP here mainly to distribute all the information uh, from this uh, ACME proxy to the, uh, that's located in the access networks to the, to the ground ground border routers, which are LISP XDR routers. Um, and this ground ground border routers uh, the multi-link policy enforcement points for the uplink traffic. I think this will be more clear in the next slide when you see the architecture things. Next slide, please. So here we see the reference topology. It's subdivided in four segments. On the left side, you see the, the aircraft segment where we have an ATN IPS system and we have here a downlink decision and enforcement point and the aircraft is typically connected to multiple, uh, via different radio access technologies to multiple um, so-called air ground communication service providers. This could be either satellite providers like Inosat or Iridium or terrestrial based providers like Medium or two 
the current existing one of LDAC. So these are very uh, domain specific uh, radio access technologies. Um, you see here, the next segment is the air ground um, access network segment where we have this ACMI, this domain specific protocol endpoint on ground. The endpoint in the aircraft is sitting in the in the Ethan IPS system. And with this domain specific protocol, we're exchanging all the information to the ACMI ground proxy, which then forwards this to the next segment, which is the LISP segment. And that, that's why it's called ground-based, since all the LISP elements are located here on ground. There's an alternative proposal where all the LISP elements located in the aircraft. And finally, uh, the last segment is then the, the operator and the user segments. That's mainly ANSB, so air navigation service providers like FAA or not, or airlines like Lufthansa or um, British Airways and so on. You see here uh, all the appropriations we are using. One important I want to mention is the, the MMB, the mobile network prefix. So this is um, a unique, globally unique uh, IP version six prefix administratively assigned to an aircraft. So which the aircraft is using for communication during all the uh, phases of flight. And this is uh, slash 60 IP version six prefix, which is um, used from the IP version six area that is ICAO asking uh, from a big uh, address space. So next slide, please. Yes, thanks. So a few words about the concept. So typically the aircraft starts with attaching to one or more of this air ground access networks, mainly by using specific radio access technology specific uh, means. Uh, it needs typically to authenticate to the, to the access network. And then the access network uh, forwards typically that announces that this mobile network prefix is reachable over the specific air, air ground access network. And uh, sorry, the, the in, in remote, they ask to you, you speak closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Otherwise, they don't yeah. hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so then the aircraft uh, it advertises the reachability by, by, by sending the mobile network prefix to the, to, to the access network. And for that, it's using the, this already mentioned ACME protocol. In addition, we are the ACME protocol. We also um, exchange information like uh, the, the link status and some uh, specific traffic scope. Traffic scope here um, summarized by a sub MMP. So a sub network of the mobile network prefix. And with this, the aircraft is able to announce routing preferences to the ground for the uplink uplink traffic, meaning which, which uh, link the aircraft uh, recommends for uplink traffic for a specific traffic scope. So what in addition as an extended admin information, there is some need for sending 4D traje trajectories to the ground, meaning the current position of the aircraft with a timestamp that's for some users uh, needful to, to use this for a policy decision on the uplink traffic. And, in a, and some users need also a digital signature from the aircraft so that they can verify the identity and the integrity of the information that is forwarded. So this information then is sent to the ACME ground proxy and the ACME ground proxy we currently we're using a a northbound interface to forwarding this and mapping this information to the LISP control plane, mapping the preferences to LISP priorities. And this can be used by the ground ground router. So the LISP XDR on the other side to getting all the preferences and can, can use this preference for uplink routing decisions. For that, we're using the pops up mechanism that means the ground ground router subscribes to the MMP 
um, to this mobile network prefix, and it should also automatically subscribe with this to all the sub prefixes. In this example, we have two sub prefixes, A1 and A2. And I think in the next slide, I'm explaining how this will be used. So next slide, please. So this is the multilink usage. That means the preferences are sent down. And in this example, the aircraft sending a preference for, for the sub network A1 should be using the upper, um, uh, the, the lower, the green one, the lower access network and the sub prefix A2 uh, should use the, the upper access network. And the decision in point is the ground ground router. So it receives all the preferences, the mappings from the EID, so the mobile network prefix and all the sub MMPs, the sub networks at the, the cache in the cache of the ground ground router. And it using this to make um, the decision that the A1 traffic should be forwarded over the air ground access B and the, the A2 traffic should be forwarded over the access network A. So that's mainly the multi-link that we are, uh, are we using a list for, for, for a multi-link scenario. And so the next slide. You have three minutes left, depending how you want to do Thank it. you. So the uplink local policy is a use case I mentioned already. There are some users, they're using this only as a recommendation and to want to use additional information to override this. That means in that example, um, the local policy overriding the A2 traffic, it should also go over the access network. So that means we need for this, for this a, a policy decision point, uh, which is located somewhere in the in the in the Atsu domain and with this it reads out the preferences from the coming from the aircraft and is able to override this by by the local policies and for that information doing so we need uh, some additional information that just results in the last slide it's the next one thank you so this is what we are requesting from the uh, our support from the from the ITF from the list working group, the most important point is that we need in our domain standards for the list control and data plane protocol. So the lack of these standards is currently the major risk for our, our ground based list solution. So that's an absolute must. So that the RFC 6830 and 6833 should go on the standard track. Without that. It's very difficult for us to use this. Uh, the pubs up, publish subscribe functionality for Lisp. We, we, we would ask if you can move this from the experimental to the standard track. Uh, in addition, because we are using the pubs up functionality for the mobility. In addition, we, we are asking for some additional clarifications and functions like a selective subscription operation and what happens after the registration, explicit selective unsubscription and so on. So a few items we, we are, would like to have some clarifications and some discussions on that. We are asking for a network mobility support. So that means there is perhaps a flag that shows that this is a mobile network and we could automatically remove all longer sub prefixes as you have seen we're using sub prefixes uh, for traffic scoping, and this would help inside the mapping system to deregister or remove uh, longer sub prefixes. We want to include the network mobility feature to draft to the draft ETF list BAD mobility proposal. That's something that would help us to refer to this. And finally, some think that would also help us to transport more information instead of LISP. I mentioned the 4D trajectory snapshot, digital signatures should be forwarded from the aircraft over the ACME um, to the ground ground router over the LISP control plane. So if there existing a mechanism to allowing that, that would help to use LISP for that. Otherwise we have to use an alternative solution for that. And we would also like to get an advice from you 
if we're either giving this in a specific change request to the to the to the ITF to the LISP ITF working group, or an alternative approach, we could create an experimental RFC for multi-link mobility that more or less describes the needed, the additional needed, the additional needs, and we referencing to the all the other uh, RFCs, generic pops up and mobility RFCs. So whatever is the better process. Thank you. That would help. Uh, that, that we have. Yeah, that yeah. concludes my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, this is Albert Acabello. Thanks for your presentation. I think it's a very interesting use case. And also thanks for the for this slide. I think it's super clear what you're asking, and that's always uh, something which is good. Uh, I'm curious about the, the well, the first bu bullet point I cannot comment. Maybe Luigi can comment. I think it is what it is. And the last one, I don't have any opinion either. But regarding the publish subscribe, could you elaborate a little bit further on the selective subscribe and explicit selective and subscription and wildcard? I don't understand that. Uh, with, with selective subscribe means we, we, we subscribing only for one or for a number of specific multiple network prefix, for a number of spe specific EIDs, not for all. Okay. We want so to, to a, a list prefix, of EIDs, we want to subscribe. Okay, so not a prefix, but slash 32 inside that prefix. Right, for example, yeah, okay. with the wildcard slash 32 oh, slash okay. 40 slash 42. Okay, and then uh, the digital signature, I don't understand it either. Yeah, the, the digital signature is something that some users on ground would like to verify if there come preferences from the aircraft to the ground, how the uplink traffic should should descend. That this is forwarded over the ACME, over the LISP domain to the to the FAA, for example, to the ATSI domain, and they want to verify that this message comes originally from the aircraft. That means it should be at the signed, digitally signed, and this should be forwarded over all the different protocols. Currently, we're doing this over the domain-specific ACME, but there's no way to forward this over LISP. It would help us if we have a specific part of LISP where we can use a specific data, forwarding user-specific <laughs> data over the mapping system to all the XTRs. Okay. But that's just, yeah, it would okay. make it simpler for us. Uh, otherwise, we need an, an alternative protocol. Yeah, okay. I understand. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, that's why you have one sentence and we move forward. <laughs> <laughs> I think we support most of that. Let's discuss after the meeting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on the requirements, I would say you send an email to the mailing list uh, with, with what is needed for you so that the discussion takes place there as well. Sharon. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the main uh, purpose of this um, discussion now is there is no change to the uh, RFC draft list next uh, network hexagons. Uh, it's in uh, the Alvaro queue, but uh, there is a lot of progress in the industry, uh, which I want to update you and ex experience we're getting by deploying with multiple carriers in Japan, in the US with the uh, AWS wavelength. Um, so sorry. basically, sorry. This thing doesn't, the listener is not a, something on its own. It speaks to uh, industry consortium work in the auto edge industry, uh, which aims to unify what is termed V2V or vehicle to vehicle architecture where vehicles tell each other about immediate problems, which doesn't work. And V2C, which is an aggregation into the cloud by all vehicles overnight, takes a few days. So we are able to unify with this inner consortium work, the immediacy uh, and programmability, the immediacy of B2B, the programmability of vehicle to cloud, but eliminate the interoperability impossibility of B2B. Every car gets multiple points of view for the same things uh, from uh, the online site, uh, which is a big problem, and the lag of vehicle to cloud using one architecture. The question is why Sharon, you need to stay close to the mic. We can't hear you. Yeah. You need so to the stay at the mic. Sorry, sorry, John. The question is, uh, was it over lunch? So why do we tie this whole structure with application routing and not with Kafka and uh, database queues and all these mechanisms? And let me try to uh, clarify that. So try to do it as quickly as I can. So first of all, volume. If we are talking about a city of a million active vehicles, like Paris, LA, um, and I want to use 10% um, of the vehicles to sample what's going on, 
for double parking, hazards, blockers, sudden stops, uh, things like that. Then I'm talking about in any given second, 10% um, of the vehicles are sampling. They're moving at 30 meters per second. They need 10 frames per second in order to capture a point of interest. That means a million frames per second for the city and half a terabit, okay? These are, have to be processed by GPUs. The best case for GPUs is a thousand frames per second. That means I have to really distribute between multiple sites in the city. That's routing, that's not a Kafka job. And then I have to consolidate this amount of traffic in the city so I can upload just the exceptions and changes to the cloud using one gigabit mix, okay? On the downstream, next slide. On the downstream, if I have a million vehicles that over the next second are going to be in 10 tires, depending on the traffic pattern, and I have a, a thousand active events in the city of people unloading, loading, making offenses, jaywalking, affecting a hundred tires each, that every second I have to calculate a join of a million vehicles times a thousand events at a billion times a thousand tires at a trillion. That's impossible to do. The only way to do it is using feeds, which are already pre-joined, uh, multicast feeds, single free application uh, uh, multicast uh, feeds uh, that uh, scales really well, all right? So that's why application routing. It relates to a lot of the discussions, this ITF. What do we get? We get something like um, an air traffic control for the city. So just like in air defense, missile defense, I uh, separate the space into zones so to know what's going on in real time. That's what I'm doing on the road for using crowdsource. This is improving the driver experience, but really, Looking forward to the near future, that's the only way to scale AV density, not to get AVs into situations which are hard to get out of, because then I can gridlock the city when the number of AVs goes up and also reduce the cost of an AV. I cannot have a $10,000 car with a $10,000 computer. So that's what we're after. Uh, slide down. The way we do it is, uh, you know that already from the draft, we use an EAD space to divide the, the earth, pre-divide the problem into uh, EAD and hexagons, and we use the crowd to post data and process them in the hexagon. So this is familiar. Uh, there is a nice animation here of a car driving. You can uh, check it out offline, we cannot do it here. But the RTRs are steering the uploads to the hexagons where all the uploads for a given location are being processed and consolidated. Nice, nice. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next slide. That's the upstream. On the downstream, what you can see is once a detection, uh, a change, an exception was detected, there is a notification from the EAD to the RTR and to the RTR in the cloud. Replication is done by the RTR. This scales the multi-billion join. Next. This is a try in KDDA. Multiple providers. There's a lot of uh, edge providers in the game right now. Also Amazon, but it's not the only game like in cloud. Uh, the OEMs have uh, um, computational facilities in the city, other companies. And this is a trial going on in uh, Japan. There is a deployment in New York. And there's a big trial going on in Nevada with, uh, with AWS. Next. Okay, so just to understand what does application routing solve here, Lisp. So in a cloud situation, I load balance clients between servers. Okay, because it's all shared uh, storage. In an edge situation like this, I cannot load balance the clients. These clients have to be in this service. These clients have to be in this service because the service is the location, has to consolidate. So 
what I have to do is solve a bunch of issues using application road. So I am, instead of balancing clients on services, I'm balancing services on servers. I'm moving servers around based on activity, okay? And that is solved by the Lisp uh, interaction. I have a problem of geo privacy. Associating with a service means that if I'm uh, subscribed to a parking service, the parking service provider knows where I am all day long. That's impossible. Um, when I'm driving between locations, I'm changing context. That's a DNS multi-second uh, break in the service. That's uh, unacceptable. This is all that. And if I'm changing carriers, I'm changing my identities, and that's unacceptable. And this is all that. Next slide. Sh Sh Sharon, we are out of time. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. So, just uh, a few, two slides or three slides. So this <laughs> solves all these problems. Next. Okay, if I put Lisp in the Mac, then I have a terabit per second from the mobile core split into using uh, Metro Ethernet to the local zones. I'm solving the capacity problem well. Next. I'm solving the queuing problem. If I have a queue per vehicle, it's uh, five megabits per second, 10 microsecond, 10 millisecond away, and I optimize the queuing from the uplink using RTRs. I cannot bring processing to the Mac. There's no space. And the RTR are able to solve that problem and the high availability problem. Next. And downstream, the join problem we talked about. Next. It's really important to understand that this is just one piece of this industry specification but it's the connector between AutoEdge and 3GPP. Why? Because 3GPP interface is to an application server. There is no application server for this edge application. Application routing is the application server. Okay? That's it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. I'm sorry, but we had, don't have time for questions. Uh, I thank everybody. I say goodbye, take care. See you again in Philly, online, remote. We'll see, okay? <laughs>